please welcome David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, and Carolyn Miles, President and CEO of Save the Children, with Ann Simmons, Global Developmental Writer and Editor, Los Angeles Times. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to get started immediately. You know, in okay. um, English primary schools, if you say good afternoon, everyone, then everyone has to say back to good you. Afternoon good back. afternoon, That's everyone. Right. Back in a very <laughs> no polite better. way. If you want to do it again, you say, come on, children. Good, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. <laughs> That's great. Well, we're going to get started immediately. Um, we're talking today about uh, all of the humanitarian crises around the world and uh, what needs to be done. There are so many of them, and particularly um, with these two great organizations, uh, the International Rescue Committee and Save the Children. So, I mean, given the unprecedented, unprecedented number of people displaced and the crisis that we're seeing around the world today, we have hunger, we have displacement, we have conflict. There is a danger of compassion fatigue. How do you challenge that? How do you combat that if people actually do want to help, but they don't know if their help's actually going to make a difference? Well, I think one of the things that you have to do, two things I would say. One is you have to tell people about the real people, right? These, these crises are really, you hear the numbers, the numbers are huge, there's millions, but you have to get it down to individual stories. And, and that really struck me, I think, when I was in Kenya uh, this summer to visit uh, a country that has been really swept up in the, in the hunger crisis there. And, you know, met a little boy who was, Two years old, he weighed about 12 pounds. I think my sons weighed 12 pounds when they were like three months old. This little boy was two, couldn't walk, wasn't speaking. You see the human impact that this has. And as a parent, particularly, you know, you think about what if I had lost my child when they were two years old. So I think that's one thing you have to do is bring it home with stories. The other thing is we all have to work together. And I think that's something that organizations like IRC and Save the Children are looking at how do we work more together, not just on the ground, but in pushing out awareness. See, I think that people are compassionate. I think they want to know whether or not they can have any impact. And the Pope, who's been an extraordinary tribune for refugees and displaced people, he's accused the world of what he called the globalization of indifference. It's a very telling phrase. But actually, I don't know if you're allowed to disagree with the Pope, but um, the, uh, I actually think he's wrong. I don't think it's a globalization of indifference. What we know is that people lack information about the solutions that are available. So just to take the American example, less than one in five Americans know that there's a famine being declared in one of the African countries in South Sudan and that three other countries are on the verge of famine. But when the millennial generation find out that there is a famine, they want to, 75% of them want to know what to do about it. And I think our job as NGOs is to show there's not just suffering, there are solutions. The resilience of the people on the ground needs to be matched by our ability to show that we can make a difference with them. And whether you look at education or employment or even the relief of hunger, what I've learned in the last three or four years is actually we're able to do much, much more than people realize. And I think we've got a responsibility to show that we're in the solutions business not just in the advertising of suffering yep. business. And I want to use occasions like this to say, organizations like Save the Children, International Rescue Committee, we're on the front line, ready to do more, and we can do more if you support us. But doesn't that take, David, political will? And right now we're seeing, this, we're in this climate where, where people are worried about refugees. We have, uh, you know, we've got Brexit, which many people said was a result of the fact that people don't want immigrants in their country. We've had a kind of, you know, the rhetoric here with regards to refugees. Um, there seems to be this kind of vacuum. Is that likely to be filled? Well, I think and how we're, we're meeting the day before the UN week starts. And you have to say, there is a vacuum of leadership, a vacuum of moral and political leadership on the great humanitarian crises of the day. Mm. Yemen, we have staff also in Myanmar ready to go into the north of Rakhine State, but unable to do so. Who's standing up for humanitarian access? In northeast Nigeria, if you look around the world, the peace processes are completely stalled. And that is the vacuum of political leadership. And I think what people fear is therefore the problems become so big 
that you're right. stuck in a vicious circle where the kind of attacks on refugees and immigrants that you've referred to do become the order of the day. But my reflection is that for every person who's afraid of a refugee coming to America, there's an American who wants to stand up and say, hang on, this country was built by refugees right. and immigrants. I run, you know, IRC is based in New York. We were founded by Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. one of the most famous refugees to ever come to this country. And I think it's important, in the, just as the administration is figuring out how many refugees should be, come to America this year, there's a threat that it will slash the yes. number, gut this program. We've got to say, look, this is part of the American story. And I, I'm relieved to be saying, it's not me as an outsider saying that, there are literally millions of Americans who want to stand up and say that as well. Well, do you feel the same way, Carolyn? I mean, you know, sure. let's take the issue of hunger specifically. Yeah. When I talk to people, when I'm doing reporting, I find that many people actually don't know that there's such a, a hunger crisis around the world. That's right. And, and, you know, the UN has called this the worst hunger crisis in 70 years. And the major countries that are impacted, Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, Nigeria, you know, immense suffering there. But as David said, I think part of what people have to understand is there are things that we can do. And when I was in Somalia, one of the things that I saw, which was so amazing to me, was I was out in the middle of complete nowhere, and we were actually doing a cash transfer program on, a, on little flip phones nice. to mothers. They were able to take those phones and go to the market and use those phones to transfer money. No cash ever passed hands. If you had told me we'd be able to do that in the most remote area in Somalia, I would have said nice. you're crazy. But the technology exists, and people have to realize that they actually can make a difference, right. that actually these things are working. There are ways to get help to people who need it, even so, in the so most remote areas. Is cash assistance then the answer? You know, we look for yeah. solutions. What are the yeah. durable solutions? I mean, cash, cash is, I think, you know, cash assistance is part of the solution. I mean, in places like Somalia, you know, there are also some very basic things. I mean, these are people who live by herding animals. You have to actually keep the animals from dying. You have to feed the animals. That's not a very high tech solution, right. but it has to be done. But I so. think it's an important point. The, the history of humanitarian aid is that you give people relief, a tent, food, right. um, a fleece if it's getting winter, and then you presume that they're going to go home. But if you think about refugees, the average refugee is out of their own country for 10 years now. Right. And after five years, if they're displaced for five years, the average goes up to 21 years. So you've got to think about how can people be included in the market economy, which is why cash is the, should be the first thing that we think about. Secondly, you've got to think, how do the adults get into work so that they can contribute to the local economy and have a return? And thirdly, how do we educate the kids? Because obviously, if you've got 21 years of duration, you're going to have loads of kids uh, right. being born. And I think that means fundamental change in the way the humanitarian sector thinks of itself. Because the history is, after the Second World War, we were set up to keep people alive. Right. And obviously, it's important to help people survive. But if there's displacement for that length of time, you've got to be thinking, how do people thrive not just survive. And I think that means a change of mindset. It's a big challenge to the UN institutions, who frankly have got a lot of work to catch up with the way in which the world it yeah. has changed. And I think if we can do that, we can inspire a generation to think there are new battles that can be not just fought, but actually won. Well, in the, in, well and the yes. education piece, I, I think this is a really important point because there are millions of kids that are in the countries surrounding Syria, for example, that yes. are going to be there probably forever. And those children have got to get an education. You know, Save the Children put out a call to say every refugee child should be in school within 30 days of being displaced. Wow. Now, people kind of said, that's crazy. Like, you, you could never do that. But I have to say, it changed the way people thought about education. It's not a luxury for these children. Right. It's not a luxury for displaced kids. It's survival. It is about what we have to do to get keep kids you know, able to keep going. But right. just, to, just to give you a sense of the scale of the problem, yeah. I mean, Carolyn's absolutely right about the goal. Half of all refugee kids of primary school age are not in primary school. Right. And three quarters of refugee kids of secondary school age are not oh, in primary awesome. school. If you look at Jordan, Queen Rania of Jordan is speaking at this summit, I think. Uh, if you look at Jordan, their response plan the response plan developed by the UN and others, 0.04% of the budget went to early childhood intervention. Right. Right. A tiny proportion of the overall humanitarian budget, 2%, goes to education. So there's a massive shortfall, even in places where there isn't a war going on. Right. Because there isn't a war going on in Jordan, or Lebanon, 
or Iraq, in northern Iraq, where there's uh, 250,000 Syrian refugees. But the education is not being provided to the kids, and that causes long-term problems. Well, I think you've both made some very critical points. I hope the message gets across. Unfortunately, we've, we're out of time. Thank you very much to both of you and to your organizations. Thank you. 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 Thank you.